Good evening. Could I just ask, please, if there is a spare seat next to you just to move in? We've still got a couple of people arriving. Um, likely they'll arrive from the back door. It would be very easy for them if they could just sit on the side. Jeremy, you need to stop laughing already, my friend. I've got to say, Jeremy is the nicest architect I've ever met. I know that's tough in a room full of architects, but he's good value. And I've got a picture of him that I might share later too. Um, Welcome, full house. It's so good to see this place full, um, overflowing even. It, it kind of makes all the work that we do feel valuable. And of course, we're so excited to have Jeremy join us tonight. But firstly, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to their ancestors who came before them and to the elders still living today. The location of the State Library on Kurilpa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering and sharing place for Aboriginal people, and we proudly continue that tradition here today. I was so excited about talking about Jeremy that I forgot to introduce myself. Um, my name's Adam Jefford. I'm the manager of the Asia Pacific Design Library. I get the great job of doing a little bit of housekeeping, and it is important tonight because we are at capacity. So the exits are here and behind you um, on the right or your left. In the case of an emergency tonight, just go to your closest door and we will assemble outside the Gallery of Modern Art, which for those of you that haven't been there is directly behind us. Um, if you need a bathroom, they are accessible on both levels. If your phone is switched on to making noise, please make sure it's on silent. You don't need to turn it off because, of course, we want you to be taking those pictures and tweeting about the lecture tonight. The hashtags, somewhere, bottom right-hand corner, APDL lecture. Um, you can tag us, you can tag UQ Architecture. Um, we love the conversation and we'll be following along as well. We are also, for people that couldn't come along tonight, we are recording tonight's session. Um, it's streaming now through Facebook and through the UQ Architecture um, Facebook page. And it will be available uh, for the next week through those links. And then very shortly, it'll be on the APDL Vimeo channel. And for those of you that are interested in CPD points, and I've got to say, we've been getting some fantastic articles from members in the audience, some of which we'll be publishing shortly on Design Online. Keep them coming. Um, we really like them, we really like to share your, uh, your reviews, your reflections, your points of view. Um, all of the information about the CPD points is on Design Online and you can also access it through the SLQ What's On page, there's a link there. So, my job now to introduce Kelly Greenup, University of Queensland School of Architecture and the 2017 series curator. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Adam. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture. Before I introduce Jeremy, I'd like to briefly mention the school's social outreach studio. The social outreach studio offers students the opportunity to travel to rural and remote communities and collaborate with organisations who are facing social or economic disadvantage. The studio aims to connect architecture students with communities where architects and design ideas are less common. Students learning in remote and regional areas are better equipped to meet future challenges and will be encouraged to work outside their comfort zone in their careers as architects. I'd like to encourage you to donate online today. Just Google search for Social Outreach Studio UQ. Now on to tonight's lecture, Jeremy McLeod of Breathe Architecture. Jeremy is the founding director of Breathe Architecture, a team of dedicated architects that have built a reputation for high quality design and sustainable architecture for all scale projects. Breathe has been focusing on sustainable urbanisation and in particular have been invest investigating how to deliver more affordable housing to Melbournians. Breathe were the instigators of the Commons um, housing project in Brunswick and are now collaborating with other Melbourne architects to deliver the Nightingale model. Nightingale is intended to be an open source housing model led by architects. Jeremy believes that architects through collaboration can drive real positive change in this city we call home. Now, when we received that bio, I think Jeremy was writing about Melbourne, but tonight's panel discussion will also include James Davidson, who recently gained the first Brisbane Nightingale licence. So that'll be really interesting to hear about his motivations and the plans for that going forward. Um, so Nightingale is literally coming to this city, which we call home sometime in the future. 
But for now, let's welcome Jeremy McLeod. Nicest architect ever. <laughs> I just saw Darcy, one of my students from last year's Nightingale Night School in the crowd before. You could ask Darcy later if I'm the nicest architect ever. He might have a different answer for you. Um, I've got a lot to get through. I'm going to talk about debt to equity ratios, um, uh, funding models, spreadsheets, all that exciting stuff. So um, I guess I'll just um, jump in. So we've got a problem in Melbourne, and I think that it's a problem that's, that we're also seeing in Sydney, and we're starting to see it in Brisbane, and it's happening in Perth. And it's happening in London, and it's happening in San Francisco, and in fact it's happening in nearly every um, capitalist society around the world, where the government has turned over housing to the free market, turned away from their responsibility to house their people, unlike Denmark, and instead left it to um, property developers. I know there are some property developers in the audience. We can talk later. <laughs> um, so what's Melbourne look like? So we're currently at five million people, we're heading towards 8 million people in 2050. Um, essentially, Melbourne looks like it's going to grow by 100,000 people year on year for the next 30 years. And the state government has no plan on how to fix that particular problem. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Victorian Planning Authority recently opened up uh, the urban growth boundaries. To, so, so Melbourne over the last 20 years has built over 40% of its farming land. And so the recent response to our housing affordability crisis is to be open up more of that farming land to build um, freestanding houses on. In the 1980s, uh, the state government in Victoria started to um, sell off their, um, their public housing and started to give over um, housing requirements to private developers. So what we've got currently is a two-speed housing model um, in Victoria, and it's, I think it's pretty similar everywhere and, and here as well. And so basically what we've got is... Um, the, uh, the, the medium density or the high density housing delivered for investor stock. So 85% of housing in Melbourne um, that's in multi-residential housing is designed for investors. It's bought by, um, by investors in Shanghai or Kuala Lumpur. Um, it's sold offshore. So there's a, there's a property company in Melbourne that, that's, that brags about having a 60,000 long waiting list to buy its property. What we've seen lately in Melbourne is this massive issue of perhaps oversupply of that investor stock in the Docklands and the CBD because um, the federal government has recently changed the foreign ownership laws. So watch this space. For owner-occupiers in um, Victoria, they don't want to buy into a multi-storey building because they associate it with crap. They think that their dog boxes, that they're poorly built, that they're poorly designed, poorly executed, that they're just built for profit. And they're probably right. The, um, the way that the consumer is protected in Victoria is through the homeowner's warranty insurance scheme. Um, that homeowner's warranty insurance scheme doesn't work or isn't applicable for any building over three storeys. So if you want to build a freestanding house in Victoria and you want to live in it, um, everyone tends to buy freestanding houses um, and they're getting further and further out from the city. So on one hand, this is Hong Kong, not Melbourne. It's okay if you think that looks like Melbourne because you're probably right. Melbourne does look like this. Um, and on the other hand, this is Craigie Burns. So this is 26 kilometres north of Melbourne. Um, and the problem with both of these models is that they're designed around profit, not around the human. And both of them have these issues of modern isolation. If you live in... And the reason that I've shown Hong Kong is that Hong Kong currently has a plot ratio control of 1 in 14. Melbourne CBD has a plot ratio control of 1 in 18 which means that Melbourne CBD stands to be taller, denser, closer, darker than Hong Kong. Um, and that's with uh, a Labor planning minister in power, not a, more, uh, not a, not a different planning minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, the, uh, on the other hand, so, so we've got freestanding bungalows. So in 1960, Robin Boyd wrote, wrote The Great Australian Ugliness. And when he wrote about that, he warned us about urban sprawl and this idea that the motor car wasn't going to answer all of our problems. So there's this problem with isolation in both of these things. If, um, if you live in a building that's made of 300 apartments, humans can recognise about 150 people and remember their names, remember what they do and build a relationship with them. 
when you have 500 people living in the same building, there's this sense of anonymity that comes in. So when you get in the lift, you don't bother to talk to someone because you don't know who they are, you can't remember their name. You don't even try. Um, so you can be living in one of these buildings and surrounded by people all around you and not know any of them. In this example over here, um, you're totally relying on your car. It's, uh, it's 2.6 kilometres to the nearest um, place to buy bread or milk in this, in this street in Craigieburn. So to get here, you, you drive your car, you drive into your, um, your garage, the roller door comes down behind you, you step out of your car and into your dining room. You need a litre of milk or some bread and you walk out of your living room, back into your garage, get in your car, the roller door goes up and you drive there to go and buy it, then you come back and you repeat it. But you never actually run into your neighbour. Well, you might run into them, but you don't actually stop and talk to them. So we want to talk to them, we don't want to run into them. So our problem in Melbourne currently, and I think that we've got the same thing here, is that we've got an urban compression model driven by larger property developers, and then we've got this urban sprawl, which is um, you know, um, pro promulgated by volume builders. This urban sprawl issue is, is seen as um, people's only possible affordable, uh, their, their only chance around affordability getting into the market. The problem is that, um, as Darcy can probably tell you, that one of our students modelled what the actual cost of living out here is, and over the course of a 25-year mortgage, it costs you $1.2 million more to live out there. The average cost of owning a car in Australia is $11,500 after tax, and if you live out here, and there's more than one of you, you need two cars. The City of Melbourne did some work about um, 10 years ago looking at this idea of moderation. What happens, is there a better solution? Can we look to other overseas models where perhaps um, there's a simpler, easier solution? They looked at examples in Rome, in Barcelona, in Paris, in Amsterdam, even in New York. And historically, they looked to Melbourne pre-1955, so before the motor car took off. And what they found was that the common thread between all of these cities was that there are about six, maximum eight storeys, that the streets prioritised pedestrians, and that they had a sense of community also, that within that there were active street frontages, so um, shops, cafes, things that would work. They looked at rolling this model out across, um, so, the, so the city of Melbourne ran numbers um, along train lines, tram lines and major high streets and they found that they could house two million people within the next 30 years along those, um, those main um, transport routes um, at, at about six to seven storeys. I don't know where we put the last million people, but it's a good start, right? So we thought that we'd act on this. So Breathe Architecture and a couple of other architects, um, we put some cash together. We raised a million dollars between us. We borrowed against our houses. And um, we thought that we'd build the commons. So mind you, this started, when we started this project, it was called Nightingale, but um, some great, really smart marketing guys came on board and thought that changed the name. But it's okay, we got the name back later. Anyway. Um, those marketing guys charged $60,000 to change the name, by the way. Um, so the idea was that we would build Australia's, um, well, particularly Melbourne's um, first triple bottom line apartment building. We wanted to build Australia's most sustainable apartment building. We were young and naive, or younger and more naive. And we wanted it to be sustainable. We wanted it to be livable. So we wanted people to choose to live there as owner occupiers. So an apartment culture exists in Paris, in, um, in, in Amsterdam, in Copenhagen, in Berlin, but in Melbourne it doesn't exist because people would only ever live in an apartment if they had no other choice. And we wanted to flip that on its head and say if there was something worthwhile choosing in an apartment, perhaps people would actually choose that. And lastly, we wanted to make it affordable. And everyone said, that's ridiculous, you can't make something sustainable and affordable simultaneously. And so we thought we would build one as a pilot project to inspire property developers to do better. We were naive. The whole idea of the Commons and its sustainability approach was about reductionism. It was about sustainability through reductionism. So building less to give more. So we start by taking out the basement car park. The Commons site is next to a train station. It's on mildly contaminated land. To build a basement car park for 29 cars which is what the planning scheme called for, was going to cost us $750,000. So this is, um, the Commons is located between a train station, 
between a tram line next to the upfield bike path, one of the most heavily used bike paths in Melbourne, next to the 504 bus, next to the 508 bus. Um, it's 150 metres from the Brunswick market, like the cheapest fresh food you can buy in Melbourne. It's a Lebanese quarter of Sydney Road, so I can buy a cheese pie on Sydney Road for $3.50. I, I never have to leave Brunswick. Um, there's a panel beater next door. If I had a car, I could get it fixed there. Um, so it's got everything you could ever need. Um, but anyway, um, the planning scheme only called for five cars. Sorry, five bike spaces. Anyway, we looked at the Netherlands requirements for bikes, and instead we used that, and we threw the cars out. So we have 72 bikes, so three bikes per two-bedroom apartment, two bikes per one-bedroom apartment, and ten bikes for the retail spaces downstairs. Everyone said, that's crazy, you're never going to use that many bikes. Anyway, we had to do an annual audit of the bikes in the Commons, because one guy's got four bikes, and you know, someone else has got the folding bike, and someone had a bike that their girlfriend gave them when they were 17, and it's still there. So there's too many bikes at the Commons. Um, but, so, by, by not building the basement car park, we saved $750,000. The other opportunity that gave us was, instead of on the street having a roller door and a driveway, we put a wine shop in there. We, you know, <laughs> it started as a, yoga, as a yoga studio, but it's now turned into a wine shop. And everyone at the Commons is much, much happier about that. I don't know why. <laughs> so, and the wine shop gets used much, much more. But anyway, um, but the wine shop was sold for $450,000. So the net result of not putting the cars in saved the project $1.15 million which reduced everyone's apartment price by $30,000 as a starting point and also gave us more money to put into the glazing suite. So we put in the best windows that money could buy. Well, maybe not that money could buy, because you could buy some pretty expensive windows, but that we could buy. Um, we took out all the individual laundries. So there's 24 apartments. Rather than putting in uh, 24 laundries, 24 washing machines, 24 troughs, 48 stopcocks, 24 tundishes, and all the plumbing that goes in between all those apartments, then 24 European laundry pieces of joinery, which then take out two square metres out of each apartment. That's 48 square metres out of the whole building. Instead, we put one rooftop laundry on, the same as that you'd find in, um, in Copenhagen, the same as that you'd find in, uh, in Barcelona. Well, maybe not the same as Gaudi's, you know, beautiful, you know, <laughs> um, rooftop laundry. Actually, this is pretty utilitarian, but it does have a nice view over the rooftop garden of the city. So there's six commercial washing machines in here. Um, so it works, you know, really well from a functional point of view. So there's basically one washing machine per eight people that live at the Commons. When Trent and McKellay go to LA and they come back and they've got like three suitcases full of stuff, they can go up, upstairs and wash their clothes on a Tuesday night. It's no problems. Um, there's a pet-friendly machine. So if you've got a white dog called Ducky, you can wash your clothes in your the dog's clothes in there, and no one else has to use that. Um, but importantly, what we found with the rooftop laundry is that it's this. Um, it's a democratised space. So it doesn't matter whether you're a school teacher or a CEO, you need to wash your underwear, and this is where you do it. So it can be pretty embarrassing for the first, you know, two or three weeks, but then that's where it kind of, you know, you kind of move through it. Initially at the Commons, no one hung their clothes, their smalls on the line, and now anything goes. <laughs> um, and it's kind of, it's kind of cute. Um, but it's been, it's, it's been the place... So I, I, I moved into the Commons, um, I convinced my wife that we needed to live there to gather data on our fellow neighbours. Um, so she agreed to live there for 18 months and, um, and um, the, the deal was that I would gather temperature data, energy usage data, water data, travel habits of our neighbours um, and waste data, how much waste is, is produced at the Commons, which I've, which I've been doing. Um, but anyway, so we've been there three and a half years and, um, and she doesn't want to move out, so I'm happy. Um, Oh, the other thing about the laundry is that by, um, by not building the laundries, we saved $7,500 of the purchase price of each apartment, and we made all the living areas two square metres, two square metres bigger. Um, the same thing with the en-suite, so we didn't build any en-suites. So all the two-bedroom apartments are 75 square metres, and there's no en-suites. So normally there's a lot of bathroom porn that goes on in um, Melbourne at the moment, so I don't mean... I mean, like, you know, people want, like, marble bench tops, you know, shiny brass taps, um, you know, expensive light fittings. Sorry for the young child in the audience that I saw before. But anyway, so, um, so when we work with property developers, they ask us for lots of bathrooms, lots of bling, because that sells well in the marketing, in the marketing brochure. We took all the second bathrooms out. So all the two-bedroom apartments have two bedrooms, one bathroom, one bathroom, they're 75 square metres, and the living areas are now big enough to seat six people around a dining room table. 
the, the lounge area is big enough to sit 10 people around. So it actually works like a terrace house and much less like a, you know, a shoe-sized apartment, a shoebox-sized apartment. Um, we took out the air conditioning. We saved $350,000 out of the cost plan. And instead, we have um, uh, a glazing system that has the, the best U values in Melbourne. Um, the, the glazing suite's made up of 200 and, oh, sorry, 22 millimetres. The outside skin is 10.3 out laminated glass. It's argon filled. It works really, really well thermally. It also works really, really well acoustically. Remember, we're next to a train station. Um, it doesn't work when the windows are open, though. <laughs> So the one thing about having a non-air-conditioned building is that when the cool change comes around and you want to ventilate your building and the train runs 24 hours, you've got to kind of pick when you ventilate and when you don't. So there are some things that, you know, do need to be ironed out in the commons, I can tell you. Um, also, if you've got your window open and Pete is playing guitar on level three, you can hear that going through the light court. And Pete's not very good at playing guitar. <laughs> Um, so we took out the air conditioning, which was great from a cost point of view, so it brought down the cost of the building, but also from an operational point of view. So we didn't just take out the air conditioning because we thought it was a good thing to save money. We did a lot of, um, a lot of thermal modelling, and we got, to the building, we got the building to rate it out over 7.5 Natas stars. So the thermal envelope is very, very tight. Um, our thermal modelling said that the building would operate between 19 and 27 degrees in a heatwave event. Um, and we've been through a heat wave in January 2014. We had four days in a row over 42 degrees. And what we're seeing in Melbourne is changed nighttime conditions. Where we used to have nighttime temperatures dropping, in that heat wave event we had no nighttime temperatures in Brunswick below 26 degrees. Um, and on the last day, um, the Friday, the Commons topped out at 27 degrees on the northwest corner. So the hottest apartment with the 27 degrees. Um, it did take about two days to cool back down again, though. So again, it's imperfect, but um, it, it withstood an incredible kind of uh, heat wave event. And at the same time, within that heat wave event in, um, in Melbourne, there were two power outages over that four day period, and one of them lasted four and a half hours. Um, so all of the buildings around us that were reliant on air conditioning to keep their occupants um, cool, totally failed. And people were spilling out into the street, um, you know, going down to the local uh, shopping centre called Barclay Square, which is actually called Sparkly Bear, if you've ever been there, and you'd know why. Um, we took out all the ceilings. So we saved about $100,000 in, um, in, in uh, plasterboard ceilings and petitions, um, and we exposed all the thermal mass. And what this has done for us is that it resets the thermal mass much faster when you open the windows and bring a cool draft across the thermal mass and the actual air touches the thermal mass. It just works much, much better. It also gives us, instead of a 2.7 metre ceiling height, a 2.85 metre ceiling height. And then our sweep fans work better. We took out all the chrome and tiles. So, you know, you can love or you can hate this. I don't know whether this is a terrible aesthetic or not. Um, you know, I live there and I don't know whether I love it or I hate it. Um, we kind of, you know, we delivered the commons as kind of this set of warehouse shells, this um, imperfect beast that we thought that would uh, build a patina and age really well. And we thought that people would come and stick tiles on the wall and put in glass shower screens or get different shower curtains. And so the, the bathrooms are pretty rudimentary. The fundamental idea behind all of this is that um, if you think about um, chrome plating or think about, does anyone know an old chrome plater? No, right? They're all dead. Because <laughs> it's this toxic process that requires a lot of energy to chrome plate something. So you start with something like brass, a beautiful material, and then you dip it in electrified chrome and you bring it out and you, you cover it in chrome. Then you put your wedding ring on it and you scratch it. And so the chrome looks great on day one, very shiny, and then over time it looks worse and worse and worse until you need to replace it. So we spoke to Lockwood and we got them to pull all the door furniture off the production line before it went to the chrome platers. We spoke to Consolidated Brass in South Australia and got them to pull all the tapware off the production line before it went to the chrome platers. So Consolidated Brass, these guys were awesome. They gave us a 10% discount. Lockwood, if you're out there somewhere, charged us 10% extra. <laughs> so anyway, um, we're still dealing with Consolidated Brass, we're happy to say. Um, the other thing was that um, we had this, um, you know, we had this big heart-to-heart -heart in the office about ceramic tiles and the problem with ceramic tiles. So ceramic tiles, you know, they're made in um, Italy or Spain. They're, um, they're fired, they're glazed, they're refired. Um, they're heavy, and then they're shipped halfway around the world to get here. 
So there's all these carbon miles attached to the tiles by the time they get there. Then you hold them on the wall with a litre of toxic glue per square metre. And then you fill all the gaps with this porous product called grout. And then, you know, if you're good, you clean it once a month. <laughs> if you're really bad, no, if you, sorry, if you're good, you clean it once a week. If you're bad, you clean it once a year. But you use a bleach-based product and you flush that down the sewer. And so it's this kind of, you know, this never-ending environmental disaster unfolding right under your very nose. So we said, let's take all the ceramic tiles out. So we used the thing that goes behind the ceramic tiles, the cement sheet. We put a clear VOC, a clear zero VOC water-based epoxy on it um, and said, let's just leave it at that. We were expecting the commoners to kind of change that over time and no one has. So can I just get a quick poll? Who, who thinks this looks okay? Oh, that's not bad. All right, who, I've got to be honest, who hates it? Oh, there's one, two, all right. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, okay. So, all right, so there's a couple of haters. That's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence. Um, when the common sold, it was sold on the open market by a real estate agent. Um, and, um, and, and we were hoping that it would sell to owner-occupiers. Anyway, um, the building next door sold 85% of its apartments to investors, as per usual. The Commons sold 22 of 24 apartments to owner-occupiers. The building next door had um, two bedroom, two bathroom, air conditioner, car park downstairs, and it, and it sold for $500,000. The Commons had a two bedroom, one bathroom, no air conditioning, no car space, three bike spaces, and a rooftop garden, and that sold for $500,000. Um, three and a half years on, which is interesting, the building next door has just sold one of the apartments in there, and that same two-bedroom apartment sold for $410,000. So it had a correction downward of $90,000. Um, unfortunately, Jody sold her apartment that she paid $500,000 for, and she got $665,000 for it. So, and there's a problem in that for us because the Commons was meant to be sustainable and affordable simultaneously, but it looks like it was affordable one time only. Um, and so, you know, that started to freak us out a little bit. Also, one of the other things that's happened with the Commons is that there are a couple of apartments being rented in there. Um, there's a two-bedroom apartment in there at the moment. Remember, this is next to a panel beater and a train station. Um, and this is Brunswick, so it's six kilometres north of the city in the Lebanese quarter, uh, which is all old industry and some organised crime and stuff, you know. So it's, it's interesting. It's multicultural. I love it. But, you know, it's... Um, anyway, um, so there's a two-bedroom apartment there being rented at $650 a week. And I don't think that's affordable under anyone's um, measure. So I think we've got a problem with long-term affordability at the Commons. There's still a strong sense of community at the Commons. So most of the people that bought in haven't sold out. So there's only been two apartments which have been resold. Um, and there's a rooftop garden. There's a little blackboard that people talk to each other on. There's a Facebook page, some WhatsApp groups, some WhatsApp groups within the WhatsApp group. So there's like the, you know, the Commons, the inner circle, the inner inner circle. It's a bit weird. Um, in 2014, um, we won all these architecture awards for this building, and um, you know, which is you know, which was great for us as a practice. Um, but it was really interesting at the same time. So this this was up against um, One Central Park by Jean Nouvel, and um, when we won the national award for this, we were you know we were shocked to say the least. And when we spoke to the chair of the jury, we said, "How how could this seven million dollar building in Brunswick have possibly?" won the architecture, National Architecture Award. And they said, oh, the people at the Commons seemed happy. So apparently that's the, that's the measure to win Architecture Award. Because, I mean, if you, if you look at the Commons, it's, you know, it's pretty rough and ready. Um, it's imperfect. Um, and there's nothing really new about the Commons. It's really just a series of case studies that have been put together. So all we did, Bonnie Herring, the project architect, and I just looked at precedents. We looked at precedents, precedents in Berlin, in Hamburg, in London, in Denmark, and we said, okay, this is what they're doing, let's just do that. So I'd love to say, you know, we deserve all these architecture awards, but it's actually just, you know, Bonnie doing good research, which is a bit of a worry because I think if this building existed in Berlin, we never would have won an architecture award because it would be business as usual. <laughs> That's the problem, right? So what did we achieve? This is the building around the corner that was built just after the Commons was finished. So we achieved nothing. 
The idea was that we would build the first building in this precinct and encourage others to build something that was sustainable and affordable and a place for um, owner occupiers to occupy. This is Geox. Um, it is named after an Italian breathable shoe. It's a precast box. <laughs> you can see why, right? Um, it's, it's a precast box. If anyone here did, worked on that project, I'm sorry. Um, um, so it, it's, a, it's a precast concrete box which is painted charcoal. It has single glazing to the north and the west. And um, you know, I do not know how they ever got a building permit for this thing. Um, and all of the bedroom windows are floor to ceiling, single glazing facing due west. Like it's crazy town. Anyway, so if we really, as a practice, want to have some, uh, some agency over how to make our city a better place, how to actually have impact on housing, then we need to try again. So what we learned out of the Commons was that the Commons was, was great, not through the architecture, because we, I guess we've established that, you know, if it existed in Berlin, you know, it's, it's business as usual. But it's great because it exists in Melbourne. But the only reason it exists in Melbourne is because we decided to build a triple bottom line project. That we, we set, the, we set the, the benchmark, we set the rules, and we set the roadmap. The decision makers in property um, set the goalposts, and the decision makers are usually the people with the purse strings. So we needed to hold the purse strings. And lastly, um, don't let anyone in property development ever tell you that they're a housing provider. They're not. They run a business. The byproduct of that business um, is housing. Well, it's, you know, it's a place for people to live. And I think as a profession, we need to decide what we're going to do about that. So when we work with property developers, and we do, and we have, and we don't so much anymore, um, you know, we're seen as um, trouble for property developers for some reason. They find us difficult to get along with. Um, and, um, and I was telling Kelly, it's not that we're difficult, we just say no to some things that all of us should say no to as a profession. And, and I don't think that property developers are used to hearing architects say no. Um, anyway, they're used to structural engineers, quantity surveyors, planning consultants saying no, they're just not used to the architects saying no. So maybe we just need to practice in the mirror in the morning before we go to work. Um, anyway, so when we work for a property developer, the thing that they care about the most, it doesn't matter what it says on their website, the thing that they matter, care about the most is the cell in the bottom right-hand corner of the spreadsheet, which talks about the profit. And everything else, you know, can be pushed. So we decided that we needed to start a new model, which is called the Nightingale model. And we need to equally weight financial return so that this thing can be replicated with sustainability and livability. And let's face it, if we're not going to make it sustainable, why would we bother? Let's just all buy V8s, burn that fossil fuel up as fast as we can, have a great time, and not worry about it. Let's just get it over and done with. So the idea is, let's democratise the capital. Let's not let the people with all the money make all the decisions. Instead, let's get the architect to talk to the people who are going to live in the building and ask them what it is that they want. Do they want two bathrooms? Are they happy to pay an extra $17,000 for that bathroom and lose six square metres out of their living room? Do they want a car space? Are they happy to pay $40,000 for that car space? If they are, sure, they can have one. Um, but let's ask them. Um, and then the people putting up the money, let's ask them to sign a silent shareholder agreement, which says that they put up their money, they agree to take a 15% capped return on their money, which is a good return in today's, you know, in today's economic environment, right? Um, but they also get a social return. They also get to be part of um, a housing solution for our country, for the planet, for our cities. So who'd say no to that, right? <laughs> um, and then let's make sure it's replicable. Because the thing that we learn out of the Commons is that building one project in Brunswick has made very little impact in Melbourne. So let me take you to the fun stuff. <laughs> um, so when we started um, the second project, Nightingale One, we had 11 people on the wait list. So what had happened is we'd finished the Commons and people started emailing us saying, um, if you're building another one of those buildings, can you let us know because we'd like to buy an apartment. Um, in the July of that year, um, Open Houses Melbourne um, asked the Owners Corporation of the Commons to open up the Commons. Um, it was six kilometres from the city. We didn't think many people would turn up. There were 1,016 people came through the building that day. It was crazy. They were lining up for two hours to come through our home and um, everyone was pretty surprised by that. There was like, you know, people running around the building and uh, anyway, it was, it was weird, it was weird. There were all these people in our house. 
Um, anyway, after that, um, there were 75 people, or about 72 or 73 people on the wait list. Everyone walked through the Commons and said, that's incredible. How do I get into a building like that? So we had this momentum immediately. But beyond that, since that time, um, now that um, Nightingale 2 has started with Six Degrees, Nightingale 3 has started with Austin Maynard Architects, Nightingale Brisbane <laughs> started with James Davidson, um, what's happened is that the wait list has grown now to over 2,000 people. And, um, yeah, which is pretty incredible because we've only got 20 apartments under construction. So we've got a, a you know, big demand and very short supply. But I think that um, the way that it works or the way that I think that people are... Uh, interested to be on this wait list is not just about that it's sustainable, it's not just that it's, that it's built for community or that it's well designed and that it's well built, but I think that they understand the financial drivers behind it. So one of the requirements for Nightingale is that it's financially transparent, it's a capped profit on cost, and we take out all the middlemen, as many as, much, as, many as we can, we try to cut out as much cost as we can. So I'll kind of walk you through it. Um, so we buy our site at the same price as a property developer does. So we pay our architect and our structural engineer the same as a property developer does, so we, we're the same. But we don't engage a marketing team to spin some incredible story about how great Brunswick is to live in. You know, you could get shot any day here. <laughs> um, we don't build a display suite. Instead, we take them through our former projects. So for us at Nightingale One, we walked the, the future residents through the commons and said, this is kind of what it's going to look like. And we explained the differences. We took them to one of the cafes we'd finished. Austin Maynard is taking the residents through Tower House. Um, you know, Six Degrees taking them to all the bars that they've done. Um, we don't employ a real estate agent. So if there's any real estate agents here, I'm sorry to tell you that, you know, you've got to find another job. Um, so the real estate agents for Nightingale One um, gave us prices that, which ranged to sell 20 apartments between $250,000 and $320,000. So for the architects in the room, I'm going to put that into context for you. The agents were saying that they could sell this building for us in six weeks. Two agents would sell it in six weeks. Let's call it $300,000. Let's call it on the lower end, the cheapest agent, $250,000. Breathe Architecture's fee for Nightingale One is $240,000. There's four architects, and Bonnie Herring, I would argue, is one of Australia's best young architects at the moment. Um, and, and we're working on this project for three years non-stop. We're not sleeping, you know, it's the usual architect story. No, it's okay, actually, we're, we're going okay. But, um, but these guys were, were planning to charge more than us and just work for six weeks, and there's, you know, four of us working for three years. It is a bit of a labour of love for us, though. We build it for less because we don't build the basement car park or the second bathroom. We actually ask people what they want and we, you know, we go through this kind of dematerialisation where we kind of strip stuff out. And then lastly, we cap the profit on cost at 15% rather than the standard property development starting at 20% and then pushing up as high as the market will bear. And so this value in the middle is the value back to the purchases. So on Nightingale 1, the valuation report that we got back from the bank's valuer said that essentially Nightingale One was being sold at about $60,000 under market for a two-bedroom apartment. So we're thinking, that's pretty good. But how do we protect that? How do we stop someone from buying an apartment here today and then selling it tomorrow and making $60,000? Because we're working pretty hard to try and deliver affordability. So we work with Maddox, this you know, law firm in Melbourne that have given us heaps and heaps of pro bono work, and they write a restrictive covenant. The restrictive covenant says that you can buy an apartment in Nightingale and you can resell it at any time back to the wait list at Nightingale for the price you paid for it plus the indexing of housing in that suburb. It's linked to housing, not apartments. So you can still, you, you know, you can still get uplift if the market goes up, but you can't just profit maximise. So we're trying our best. Funny, <laughs> I know this is not particularly transparent. It doesn't work when you reverse it out, but... You get the idea. The idea is that Nightingale is totally financially transparent. All of the residents in Nightingale One have got to see how much the site costs, how much the architect gets paid, how much the structural engineers, the enviro cleanup, um, how much the development managers get paid. How, what does that 15% profit on cost look like at the end and how much of that gets paid out? At the end of all of that, we divide through the total saleable area, which sets the sales rate per square metre. It's very, very straightforward. 100% fossil fuel free. Hang on a sec. <laughs> so um, there was a, 
uh, an ARC grant, you know, issued um, to to a W to a WA um, academic, um, and there was all this work done, and there was all this Commonwealth money spent, about nine hundred thousand dollars to try and make this work. There was a white paper. Um, issued by the New South Wales government about how do we make medium density housing fossil fuel free. It's really easy, it's called benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> so um, basically we write it into the OC rules, we build an embedded network, we have a network supplier that buys in 100% renewables only um, and that gets shared through everyone, to, through everyone in the building. Um, and basically the idea is that you buy green energy in Nightingale One cheaper than anyone else is buying black energy because it's offset by 18 kilowatts of solar. Easy. <laughs> Not really. Um, but it is now. So for James Davidson, it's going to be really easy because we've already broken ourselves on that and we already resolved it for him. Um, Nightingale One by Breathe Architecture. How it looks is not important. What's important is the kind of drivers behind it. Um, so Nightingale One exists um, diagonally opposite the Commons. So the Commons is down here, and that's Nightingale One. It's not it's not by chance that that happened. We tried to secure this site for Nightingale 2, and we tried to secure this site for Clare Cousins for Nightingale 4. Neither of those have come off yet, but you know we haven't given up. We've just got word from the city of Moreland that they are now closing this street. So there's a temporary road closure happening in um, November this year, and they're gonna turn this street into a park. Um, so in our spare time, we're not being architects, we're being lobbyists and advocates. And we're talking to these residents, and we're talking to uh, these residents, and these residents, and these residents, and these residents, and the commoners, and even these guys in Geox. And, bet and between us, we're going to the council, and we're lobbying them, and we're saying, we don't have any trees around here, can you please help us? Um, so step one is by the site. And so I'm just going to say that, that we kind of did this back to front. So ideally, you would work out how to pay for the site before buying the site, but we did it the other way around. So um, does anyone here work for the ATO? <laughs> okay, so we, we bought, or our deposit for Nightingale One um, was the tax that we owed the ATO. Um, and so we had a very short period of time to then try and um, raise the funds, $2.7 million to, to close the deal. So we went to our closest colleagues in Melbourne and we said, here's the dream. Um, we sent out this email, this call to arms to Melbourne architects. We sent it out to about 30 architects. Um, Six Degrees and Austin Maynard Architects wrote back to us within 60 seconds. Um, and in fact, fun, funny, uh, Austin Maynard, so Andrew Maynard wrote back and said, yeah, we're in. In fact, we'll take two shares. Remember, each share is worth $100,000. So Andrew Maynard says, yeah, we'll take one. Actually, we'll take two shares. His wife, who was CC'd in, Kylie writes back and says, no, we'll take one share. <laughs> Simon O'Brien from Six Degrees writes back and says, this is great, we'll take two shares. Um, his wife, Barb, writes back to me and says, no, Jeremy, we'll, we'll just take one. Um, so lots of architects very, very keen, but other architects, you know, like Claire Cousins saying, look, you know, if you really need us to, we'll take a second share. So all of these architects rallied around us. The director of the Robin Boyd Foundation, Tony Lee, um, put in $100,000 because it was his belief that this was one of the first things that he'd seen since Boyd in the small home service as architects actually being agents of change, trying to change the way that housing was delivered. So Tony Lee himself put in um, money into this project. Um, apart from that, Breathe Architecture, obviously, you know, we leveraged ourselves as hard as we could. So, you know, my apartment at the Commons was, you know, put on the line for this. Um, and then we had a lot of the people that, um, uh, that had kind of worked with us in the past that, that came and helped us. So former clients, former hospitality clients um, invested in this. People in the area who had housing in the area and wanted to care about or cared about what was happening there put in money. Um, $100,000 sounds like a lot of money. Um, if you're a baby boomer in Melbourne and you bought a house just west of the train lines, um, you bought that in 1982 for about $40,000. That same block is now worth $1.6 million. So these people, just on the west of the train line of the Commons, are all um, millionaires by chance because they got on the Monopoly board early enough, not because they're geniuses, not because they worked hard. Um, and for them, they kind of had all this equity, they understood it, and they said, yep, we'll put in, we'll borrow against our house at 5%. If you can give us a 15% return, that's, that's a good outcome for us. Um, and on the other side of it, we had people with a lot of money who had been investing in other things and were just saying, actually, we want to just invest in something with meaning. 
And so we had this great bunch of people, and these great bunch of people now come to our three monthly site walkthroughs, where they get to meet the Nightingale residents and see what their money is buying. You know, to see these people are happy. So it's, it's very different for them than investing in Telstra shares or Commonwealth Bank shares. They're actually investing in someone's future, and you can see that these people are actually really enjoying it. So if any of you got $100,000, come and see James Davidson later and I'll give it to him. Um, I guess, you know, um, step three for us is talk to people that are going to live there. Ask them what it is that they want. What do they want to pay for? What are they prepared to pay for? What are they prepared to give up? What do they need to give up? Um, design a building that responds to people's needs. So this question was about um, light courts into bathrooms. So um, we can cut extra light courts. We thought everyone would want natural light and ventilation to your bathrooms, right? Um, and what we found was that um, single females, about 95% of single females, or, or females, wanted, um, wanted natural light and ventilation in their bathrooms. It was very important. They were prepared to lose four square metres out of their living area to achieve that. Guys, I um, hate to say it, but you lot kind of didn't really care, and you were like, no, give us more space to do stuff in the living room. And anyone with kids said, we would rather have the extra space in the living room. So as it turned out, about 40% of our Nightingale residents wanted light courts in their, cut into their building where they'd lose four square metres out of the living room to get extra light and ventilation into their bathrooms. So in, you know, what that did for us is that it meant that we provided light courts to 40% of the bathrooms. And then we asked people, um, oh, my eyesight is going. See what, see what working on a Nightingale project do? I'm only 27. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Um, yeah, so winter gardens. So um, the, the, the one bed is at Nightingale face south. Um, unlike Queensland, you know, it's a little bit cooler in Melbourne. And um, we asked people, would they want to pay an extra $7,500 to enclose their winter gardens to be able to open them up in the shoulder months, so in spring and autumn? And basically, everyone said, you know, most people said, yes, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so we responded to that, the south elevation. So the south elevation is this winter garden which oper operates. And then lastly, how would you describe yourself? An introvert, an extrovert, or an ambivert? Weird question, I know. Um, but the funny thing is that the extroverts always tell you what they want. We want a big barbecue space. We want to come together. We want to have, have parties. We want, to, we want to, you know, a place where we can do this and do that, and, and let's do this and let's do that. And the introverts will never, ever tell you what they want. You have to ask them. Um, so for us, it was really important to kind of identify that and also to give that information to our landscape architect. So our landscape architect is Mark Jacks from OpenWork. Um, he did some work for Mona. He works with us on nearly everything. We love this guy. Um, and so you can see on the south side of the building that he designed a space that isn't just one massive you know, um, communal table, that it's broken up into four little spaces so that someone can sit there and read a book and not necessarily be disturbed when another group comes up. Then you've got to ballot the apartment. So we've got the mayor to come and pull names out of a hard hat. So we had, you know, at that time, of the 75 people that turned up to that first um, uh, information night, after we went through all the surveys and went through all the price point, there were 57 people that went into the ballot and we drew out 20 names. Um, then we lodged a planning application and we had 170 letters, seven letters of support, again, through advocacy, talking, presenting to the neighbours around us, presenting to our Nightingale residents and the commoners. Um, and we had three objections. It's pretty good odds, right? We got council approval, so it was unanimous, voted by Moreland Council, easy. And then <laughs> we lost that permit at the um, appeals tribunal. So one of those objectors, a developer across the road, um, wanted to bring cars in off the street. We knew the long-term plan for Florence Street for us was gonna be around turning that to a park. And we tried to convince him on the story that he would be better off selling his apartments to his south-facing apartments looking over a park than looking over a car park. But his marketing agent said it's much easier to sell um, apartments with a car park that comes off the street. So anyway, long story short, they said, if you don't withdraw your objection to ours, we're going to fight you at VCAT. And we said, that's OK. It's, for us, it's not about a commercial reality. It's about the right urban design outcome. Um, so we, mind you, we never thought we'd lose at VCAT. Um, so we went to VCAT and um, the developers uh, spent about $50,000 on a legal team uh, and, and a traffic engineer. And, um, and we drew a 72-year-old um, tribunal member who 
uh, didn't have a smartphone, didn't understand what Uber was, didn't understand what car share was, couldn't quite comprehend how car share would work because what if someone's taken that car? How would I get there? And um, anyway, uh, if you read the uh, 47 pages of the finding, um, basically he sums up by saying, nothing is more convenient than owning your own car. Um, I mean, the odd thing is that I live at the Commons and I don't own a car. And in fact, um, out of the 52 residents of the Commons, there is seven cars that are owned by the people that live there. Um, so you would probably argue that it's actually more convenient not to own a car there. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles, so we lost at VCAT. That was pretty upsetting for us. Um, and for everyone in the room that wrote us an email on that Thursday, thank you so much. We got over 400 emails on that day that it went out uh, on Architecture AU. Thank you so much. It changed our world. Like, we were absolutely shell-shocked. And in the afternoon, Breathe Architecture stopped work and we were just reading emails of support from architects all around the country. So <laughs> thank you all. That was so awesome. Um, so we got up again and on the Monday, so we worked over the weekend and we lodged a new planning permit with three cars. So the whole issue was this, that we spoke to everyone and asked people, would you like a car space? It's going to cost $37,500. 30% um, of the people moving into Nightingale either didn't own a car in the first place or didn't have a current Victorian driver's licence. 85% of our purchases are aged 35 or under and they're first home buyers. So for them, $37,500 was a deal breaker. Um, the most important thing for them was getting into housing, not owning a car. Um, and so we argued that those two things, housing and car ownership, need to be separate. The Victorian planning scheme has still really struggled with that. I suspect it might here as well. So we tried again. This time we got 277 letters of support. So again, thank you for everyone that wrote a letter of support. Um, and we had one objection. Guess who from? Um, and we got unanimous council support. And this time the guys next door decided not to spend another $50,000 to take us back to VCAT because they knew that we wouldn't back down, that it was about an urban design outcome for us, about a design outcome, not about a commercial reality. And we would just keep on going back until we won. Um, also, by that stage, Maddox, the law firm, had got up and said that they were going to represent us pro bono. So it made it look a little bit less appetising because those guys are heavy hitters. Um, step 10, the easy part. You just have to build it. And um, so, my God, building is so easy compared to architecture, can I just say. So the build has been a blast and our builders are sensational. Um, and so once a month, we take our Nightingale purchases through their home. So they, they watch the building get demolished. We had a demolition party first where they got to, you know, party. And then um, they come through once a month. Um, so if at first you don't succeed, try again. And again. And again. So these are the architects that invested in Nightingale 1. Uh, Austin Maynard Architects are now running Nightingale 3. Uh, Architecture Architecture are now doing Nightingale 6, which is a co-housing group with us, in collaboration with us. They're a smaller firm, so we're collaborating with them to help pass on all of our skill set to them, under the understanding that one day when they're running, you know, five Nightingales, they will then teach a younger, smaller firm to do the same thing. Claire Cousins Architects are fully funded. They've raised $2.4 million and are now looking for a site for Nightingale 4. The Robin Boyd Foundation is just sitting back, you know, in Wall Street House, you know, being cool. Um, Martin Architects, you know, I'm not sure about, you know, they're pretty small at the moment, so we'll see what happens. Six Degrees Architects are doing Nightingale 2, they've just got planning approval. And Mulveridge Architects um, are just about to apply for their licence. So of all those initial architects, they're all about to run their own projects. We've invested back in Austin Maynard Architects and Six Degrees Architects. We couldn't put any money into Claire's because, you know, we're just poor architects and we ran out of money. Um, and, and we're involved with architecture, architecture. Um, Fisher and Paykel and Blue Scope Steel came on to help us scale this thing. Um, so we set up uh, a not-for-profit social enterprise called Nightingale Housing. The idea is that all of the IP from all of these projects goes and gets stored in this central repository, but we needed to be able to share that with other architects. So we employed a CEO, a comms officer and a resource officer. Um, so this costs us about $150,000 a run we've got to, to run. Uh, per year, and we've got um, an incredible skills-based board, uh, which you know um, is represented across the eastern seaboard. We haven't got anyone from Perth on that board yet, but anyway, um, Nightingale Housing is now working pretty hard to run. Um, it, it it holds the licensing committee. The licensing committee is chaired by the Victorian government architect Jill Garner, 
um, and they've been giving licenses out. So we've had um, about 32 license applications so far, and we've had about um, 21 architects which have actually been licensed across the country. So what that means is that um, 11 architects who have lodged for an application haven't been licensed. So if you're thinking of lodging for a licence, can you please, um, if you're going to put in a licensing application, do it well. Don't rely on your name, don't rely on the size of your practice. Um, you need to rely on a number of things, including your previous built work. So if you're ashamed of what you've done, <laughs> don't lodge for a Nightingale licence, because dual Garner is tough. Um, so Nightingale 2 by Six Degrees Architects. Nightingale 3, Boston Maynard Architects. Claire Cousins has raised her equity. This is her house, so she's probably got this on the line for Nightingale 4. Um, so there are 21 Nightingale licences around the country. Um, and the rest is up to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'd like to now welcome... Jeremy, back to the stage along with James Davidson. James is an alumnus of UQ. He got his uh, architecture degree and his PhD there. Um, and he's going to join me uh, on stage with Jeremy for tonight's discussion. Um, and we're going to ask him some questions about how it's all working. Sorry. Jeremy, it's, it's not only a new development model. So you've got all the numbers there, you've got the facts and figures about how, how it all works financially, but it's a, a bit of a new social model, at least the Commons is. Tell us how this works for you. Like, you moved in there as an experiment, but how does it, how does it feel like to live there? Yeah, so, so um, I was actually going listing all of my neighbours from apartment 101 through to apartment 404 before. I can do that for you, but there is 51, 52 people that live at the Commons if you count all the kids but do so, you know so, them so I won't do that yes I know I know everyone I know uh, I know their dogs you know I know what they do for a living um you know yeah so so and my wife was very nervous about moving to the commons and let me just preface this by saying the commons is not a co-housing project it's not um some um uh, uh uh, it's, it's, not, it's not some hippie venue where everyone has to wear Hessian undies. And, uh, you know, it's not like that. So, there, it's, so the Commons is filled with professionals. There are four people there that are retired. Um, apart from that, most people, people work at the EPA, at Sustainability Victoria, uh, for Moreland Energy Foundation, um, for the City of Melbourne. There's a few architects in there, some graphic designers. But um, so there's, you know, a bunch of normal people that live in the building. But I think that what's been fascinating for us living there is that um, some of the people in the Commons I would now consider to be my closest friends. So um, uh, two years ago, nine of us, you know, um, hired a maxi taxi and then we flew to the Blue Mountains and we had, you know, had a trip away together. I know it sounds a bit cultish. It's not a cult. Um, uh, over Christmas time, Ben and George were in apartment 202, came away with Tam and I, and so we went away. And again, you know, last Christmas we did again. So um, Ben and Georgia have become, you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, some of our closest friends. And so, um, and, and since we've started Nightingale and, and the commoners have started having babies, um, some of the people from one-bedroom apartments in, so two of, the, two of the people in the commons who've had one-bedroom apartments have now bought into Nightingale. So they're moving into two-bedroom apartments in Nightingale. So, yeah, look, I mean, it's... So yeah, look, you can live there. It's not cultish. Not everyone is in each other's, you know, business. It's actually, it's actually very nice. So I guess that's the the fear that most people have. I mean, one of the attractions of suburbia is that you've got your privacy, that you can get away from your neighbours. You don't have somebody sort of in your pocket. So, just very briefly, talk us through how it works. How does it happen that you end up with great friends there, but you don't feel like you've compromised, you know, you know your your privacy and your individual apartment. Yeah, yeah, so I think that and the great thing about the Commons is it is double glazed. Um, it's very well acoustically insulated. Um, so, you know, when you close your window and your doors, you do feel very, very, you know, it's, it, it is very insular. Um, my wife's highly introverted, which is why she's not here tonight. Um, so it suits her really well. Um, it feels very secure. So there's lots of single females that live in the Commons. Um, and if you ask Mary Ann, who's 61, why she came to live in the Commons, you know, she, yes, she loves the sustainability. She likes the ability to be able to engage with people when she feels up to it, when she wants to. 
but she also likes the fact that she's on level two, that she comes through a couple of secure points and that she's surrounded by people that she knows. Um, for her, she wanted to live in a smaller community, so she didn't want to buy into an apartment building of, you know, 500. She, she likes the fact that there are 50 people there and she knows everyone. So when someone crosses the threshold, when someone comes in through the stair door and they shouldn't be there, everyone knows because, you know, it's, um, yeah, because we all know each other. So, you know, it's okay to say to someone in the stair, you know, hey, who are you? What are you doing here? And it'll be Jane's sister or someone coming to visit. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Fantastic. James, tell us about how you've got involved. Why Nightingale? Why was this something that your practice pursued? Um, I think that... Um, oh, that's a good question. I, I love everything that architecture has to offer, and it's not just about pretty buildings. Mm -hmm. I actually think that, um, while that's a very important part of it, it's, um, I think that um, in all aspects of my career so far, I've always tried to find something that would that benefits others in a sense, and um, and I feel that of all the things that I've seen, um, and I did spend some time in development prior to being an architect. Um, uh, the Nightingale model is is the one that I actually want to get behind, and so I'm, I thought to myself, you know, why isn't it in Queensland, it, so, um, given that we've got a, a lot of apartment buildings out there that are sort of, there's a glut in the market at the moment and um, I don't know, I, I just think that it's a very important part of my being um, not to just um, come up with pretty designs, they have to actually mean something for the greater good, I think. That's, that's why I'm doing it, you know, whether it's flooding or working with Paul Mehmet, um, every mm. aspect of what I do, I want it to. I want to be involved in good things, and so I. And then I, I know Andrew Maynard, and uh, yeah, we got talking, and um, I think it was actually his idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just also say that Nightingale is a model. It's not. It's not mm. prescriptive. Yeah. It's the idea is that, um, you know, as architects, you take it. You iterate, you make it better, you know, I, I dare you to do better. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I worked, you know, I, I worked on Nightingale 3 with Maynard and, um, you know, as the development manager to secure the site and to secure some finance for them and to help them run feasibilities. And, um, you know, Nighting, Nightingale 3 is better than Nightingale 1, you know. And, you know, yeah, there's a bit of professional jealousy in there, but, you know, it also makes me happy. Nightingale 2 by 6 Degrees looks incredible. It's on this, this great site. And Simon O'Brien, the design lead on that, has done this incredible job. It's like one building that they've cracked in half with this fissure in the middle. And it's, you know, so I expect that each architect... And so Maynard's gone down this whole path of, you know, um, homes in the sky. So they're really big. And I'm saying, Maynard, they're too big. He's going, no, no, they're going to be great. They're homes in the sky. And when he went out to his purchasers and he interviewed his purchasers, they all said, we want two and three bedrooms. We want to have families here. We don't want to have to move. So he's calling it forever home, you know, forever house. Yeah. It seems to me that there's a lot of collaboration between architects in this whole Nightingale model. It's not just about the building, but it's about architects sort of getting together to work on each other's strengths. Is that something that's evolved over time or was that sort of central to the formation of the idea, do you think? So, I mean, it's interesting in Melbourne that... Um, a lot of the big baby boomer firms um, have secured most of the work. They hold most of the development work. And so it's the same firms, you know, like there's one firm that's done like, you know, 20,000 apartments in the last three years in Melbourne. Um, you know, and whereas you find um, a firm like Austin Maynard that's won, you know, every national award for single residential housing, um, yet not one property developer has picked them up to design housing at a multi-residential scale. It's bizarre. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, uh, as a bunch of Gen X firms, um, you know, we still don't have any millennial firms up and coming yet into Nightingale, but, uh, but no doubt we will. We're looking forward to that because I think that they're going to have a different take again, a smarter take, you know. Yeah. Um, but for us, it's about kind of, you know, taking the keys of the city off the baby boomers and saying, you know, we need to readjust, you know, what we're doing as a profession and we need to take some responsibility for this. And how far do you aim to take it? Is it going to be like co-housing in Scandinavia where it's a small little percentage of the market but it's an important sort of 
idea about the culture, or are you aiming to see it take off a little broader than no, that? No, it's, it's a really good question. You know, so I, I don't enjoy sitting on boards. That's, you know, it's not a thing that I enjoy doing, going to board meetings, you know, every month. Um, so not, the, the Nightingale board exists um, as long as it has to. So, you know, Maynard, James Legg from Six Degrees is on there, um, Claire Cousins is there. So we're on this board with, you know, a bunch of other people to make sure that our intent is what's happened with the Baugruppen model in Germany. So if you look at what's happened in Berlin and Hamburg, um, you know, 15 years ago, the first Baugruppen project, so building group project, was delivered by a group of people engaging with an architect and their own project manager in Berlin. Um, it took them about, you know, five years to finally get bank funding for it because it was seen as such an outrageous thing that people would, God forbid, design and build their own home. But when they finally got funding for it, it took off. About 10% of medium, um, medium density housing in Berlin is now delivered through the Baugruppen model. Um, uh, Kristen Ring's got a book called Self Made City. It's a massive book and it's just filled with Baugruppen proje projects. Hamburg has about 15% of its, of its um, housing delivered, or it's medium, medium density housing delivered through deliberative development and the Baugruppen model. And what we've seen in, in, in both those models, but particularly in Hamburg, is that it started to affect the mainstream market. So developers are now saying, actually, we've got to increase our sustainability standards because we're getting measured against Baugruppen projects. We have to improve our design and our build quality standards because we're getting measured against Baugruppen standards and we need to start tuning down our profit margin because we're getting measured against bell group and prices. So um, although it's only delivering 15% of the housing, it's had a massive um, positive impact on housing in Hamburg. Yeah. So I guess the idea with Nightingale is we think that, you know, um, we've tasked Jesse Hodgeberg, our CEO, with having 1,000 projects licensed by 2026 and 1,000 projects complete by 2029. That's 35,000 dwellings. And Peter Laylor, the entrepreneurial guy who sits on our board thinks that that's the sweet spot where we start to actually impact pricing and quality in the mainstream market. So it's pretty ambitious. That's a thousand projects, not a thousand apartments. Correct. Yeah. So housing. Well, it sounds ambitious, except when you look at you know a hundred thousand new Melbournians every year. So exactly. By that time, there'll be a million new Melbournians. So it's actually a very very tiny slice of that pie. And I guess the question is, in relation to that, is Br Brisbane's booming at the moment, Melbourne's booming at the moment, there's cranes everywhere. Is this going to come slightly too late for the current boom? Or is this going to be, you know, the steady as she goes model? Oh, look, I'm probably not qualified to comment on uh, what's happening in Brisbane. But um, yeah, I think that to a large extent in Melbourne, um, the ship has already sailed for some of the areas in Melbourne, and um, we're going to be regretting that for the next 50 years. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you all know the problem with strata titles. Uh, you know, big buildings owned by 50 different title holders. The only way to fix that in uh, 50 years' time is compulsory acquisition by yeah. the government and demolition. They're the most public of private buildings, aren't they? It's pretty yeah. hard to... Uh... Yeah. So our, our whole kind of housing model is crazy. Um, so is it too late for those areas? Absolutely. Um, but if you look at what's happening in Melbourne, it's pushing you know, out of, out of the CBD. Yeah. So we can grab precincts, pockets, you know, I know mm. that a group of seven Nightingale architects at the moment are working to, together to secure a site, a precinct on both sides of the street where all these Nightingale projects will face each other across the street and they're working with the local council to again close that street and pedestrianise it. Yeah. Now, wouldn't that be good? Sound, it sounds amazing. Um, James, mm. back to you. Can you walk us through the process of getting a Nightingale licence. How did it work for you? Has it taken a long time, a lot of thought? <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's, I, f I found it um, quite rigorous. Uh, Andrew was kind of lucky because he got in, obviously, early, and now it's... Um, He's also on the board. Yeah, so yeah. Andrew Maynard <laughs> from Austin Maynard, um, yep. <laughs> so he, he was helpful, but he... Um, yeah, there was... Um, it, it, it was good, actually, because... Um, it puts you on the spot. I don't know if you, you could download the, the forms, obviously, off the off the website, and um, it really kind of makes you think. And there's some. Um, it makes you think about your own kind of perception of things, but also your motivations too. And um, so, yeah, I went through. I understand. I heard later that um, the uh, Victorian government architect you, you mentioned. Um, 
she looked into me by ringing our government architect and um, thankfully that was a, there was a positive response there. Yeah. Um, so, and I, to be honest, when I heard that, I actually, it impressed me even more because I think if, they, if, if there's a rigorous process behind, it means that, um, behind it, then it puts people like me on the spot to actually come forward with, and, and it, it checks my motivations for things. And, yeah. you know, I, and so I found it, yes, it was a tough process. Um, and there was a bit of back and forth with Jessie. Like, I found her really, really good to deal with. Um, That's the CEO of Nightingale yeah. Housing. Um, but putting it out there, like, I'm happy to... I'm, I think, trailblazing in Brisbane. Like, if anybody's out there that would like to do it, then feel free to call and, and you know... It could, I don't think I'd give them my application. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because everybody's different. So, you know, but I'm more than happy... And that's, that's, that's actually part of why I'm doing this. Like, yeah. I... I, I'm fully aware that, you know, the first one will always be the, the hard one, and then you slowly, incrementally get better yeah. and better and better. And so that's what I'm hoping here too. So it's someone should do the second one because it'll be heaps easier. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's an interesting idea, really, because um, there's a quality assurance aspect of this, right? Somebody's checked you before you're a Nightingale architect. So it may have flow-on kind of brand um, benefits, I guess, possibly. Are you finding that...? You know well, so th that your so reputation th has changed because of this. Yeah, I mean, we've been criticised. There's a there's a there's a big firm in Victoria that got a Nightingale licence, and um, I, I didn't sit in. So I, I there's a rotating <coughs> licensing committee that sits under the Victorian government architect. She attends every meeting and she chairs the meetings. And there was um, a licence granted to one of the big Victorian architects, a baby boomer firm, and um, we got you know we got a bit of hate mail from some architects about that, saying how could you give these guys a licence? But um, you know, I think that, you know, if you look at it, um, if you look at the way that Jill Garner structures the licensing committee, the idea is that she, I know that for her, she's looked at their past work, obviously their financial capacity, have they been bankrupt or are they criminal, but also what's their built work and what have they been putting out into the environment? Is it something they can be proud of? And she obviously has the confidence that they can do great work. She's also knocked back some big firms, which has been, again, um, equally, equally um, unpopular because we've had, you know, Nightingale's received some, some, you know, some hate mail from people that didn't get a licence. But it was largely not, well, some of it was because of their built work, but some of it was because the way that they approached the licensing committee was, uh, you know, a sense of as of right, you know, we should get it because this is who we are. And they hadn't considered, you know, the question that the licensing process was asking them about, why do you want to do a Nightingale project? It's not to, you know, elevate your status as an architect, you know. Just that's that's the hint, <laughs> um, you know. You know. Um, so 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 you know. Yeah. So so the, the requirement from the licensing committee is that, that that they need to be confident that whoever the architect is, no matter what their architectural style, like you know, you know, we don't care what your style is, you know. Um, what we care is, you know, what's your intent? What have you shown in the past that 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 you have tried to achieve and what do we think you will achieve when you're actually given the freedom to do something good. Fantastic, fantastic discussion. I've been so pleased to host you tonight. Can we thank Jim, James and Jeremy, please? <laughs>
um, and about their research projects that they're working on together. They've recently arrived from Istanbul, so it'll be a really fantastic lecture and it'll be great to see what they're planning to do here. So jump online to register for that. It's nearly sold out. We'd love to see a full house again. Um, that will be our last lecture before we take a break for a couple of weeks because we have Easter and Anzac Day, but then we've got a really exciting further four weeks after that, um, taking us through to the second half. So thanks for coming along this evening and have a good evening.